Welcome to UC Santa Barbara's Innovator Story Series. I'm John Greathouse. You can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. We have with us tonight Kevin Zong, partner at Upfront Ventures. Kevin's investment thesis is, is one to, to listen to closely. He likes to place bets on interdisciplinary entrepreneurs who are solving big problems in healthcare as well as the sciences, life sciences. He's also, he's also a passionate gamer. And he's been able to take that passion in gaming and actually put and deploy investment dollars um, into that space as well. Before he joined Upfront in 2012, Kevin was with the Boston Consulting Group, where he advised a number of companies in different industries on strategy, M&A, um, as well as operations um, all over the world, US and in Asia. And before he joined BCG, he worked at Versin Technologies, which is a healthcare startup in Boston. So he came right out of school into a startup, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and he went to a school that I've never heard of. I don't know, maybe you guys have heard of it. He studied biology at Harvard College. So it's not UC Santa Barbara, but it's an East Coast school that I'm sure is fine. Let's welcome Kevin to our class. Thanks so much. Great to see you. Likewise, yeah. likewise. Thanks for making it. I know you're crazy busy, and no, getting no. up from LA is not an easy task. So we absolutely appreciate you. And that was probably the worst introduction I've ever done. So my apologies to you. No, no, that was wonderful. <laughs> and thank you for for having me here. It's exciting to to be in front of you guys and chat a little bit about upfront about myself and entrepreneurship. And it's it's great that you know um, I've known upfront for a long time. Um, one of the early investments I did was with one of Upfront's uh, marquee partners, I think at 07, Mark Suster and I did an investment here in Santa Barbara together. And so I've known Upfront for, for quite a while. And they went from being, they've really re you've refashioned yes. yourself. Yes. And it's now $2 billion in management. It's, it's the premier venture capital firm in Southern California, period. And I'd say one of the premier in, in all of the world. So what's happened in, <clears throat> over the last, uh, since 07, has been pretty incredible. Um, and I'm really excited to have Kevin here, not just to speak to the students and not just to um, you know, have the, the content for folks on the internet, but he's really making a commitment to Santa Barbara. They have a couple investments here already uh, in town, Appeal and Invoca are two of them. And he's really making a commitment to UC, uh, to, to Santa Barbara in general, and I'd say to UC Santa Barbara specifically. So we really, really appreciate the time and attention. Of course, you guys have incredible talent here. Yeah, well, I, we like to think so, um, but it's, it's nice to be discovered. So I'm, I'm always curious about an entrepreneur's home life growing up because it's just varied. Like some people, they, everyone comes from a different background. That's what's great about entrepreneurship. I'm curious, were your parents entrepreneurial? Was that encouraged at home um, or just the opposite? Were you, were you taught, you know, that, you know, get a job as a lawyer and, and don't do something entrepreneurial? Yeah, um, it's interesting. They certainly gave advice to me that was very much, you know, driven by their own path. Mm -hmm. And they were very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, I grew up in China. They grew up through the Cultural Revolution. They were the first class to go back to college when college reopened. Oh. They're both artists, actually. Um, they paint. Uh, my dad paint. My mom did textile design. My dad went to study in Italy uh, in the early 90s. My mom went to study in Japan in the early 90s. Then they moved, both moved out oh, to the U.S. and, you know, like created a whole life for themselves. Um, and really sort of for me to come out and have a better education. And then... When I moved out in nine, they were basically like, you should be a doctor or a lawyer. And Did they really? You should never, like, don't, like, don't do this crazy thing. You know, like, you're already in the best place and just focus on your studies and uh, don't do anything else. And you're like, yeah, mom and dad, you, you were artists that pursued your passion, but exactly. I shouldn't pursue mine. Right, exactly. <laughs> and they had, like, a small business. You know, they worked with various um, art galleries around town, et cetera. And, yeah, they were very much like, don't do that. <laughs> well, I, it's funny that you mentioned that about their, their, their own business and, and working with art galleries. Um, artists, you know, musicians or, or painters or sculptors, if they want to make that a career, they have to be entrepreneurial. Yes. Like nobody knocks on your door and says, hey, can I buy yeah. one of your paintings? Like you yeah. have to be a bit of a hustler. And if you're not a hustler, you need to partner with somebody that's, you know, like, uh, uh, there's um, uh, the founder of Tradesy, Tracy Denunzio. Mm -hmm. She was a sculptor. You know? yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing that we ended up investing in that deal, and one of the reasons we did was she hustled her, you know, her yeah. sculptures were in, museums when she was in her 20s and she was really a recognized talent and that's not an easy business to become recognized in when you're in your 20s so so there's got to be a little bit of that hustle so what was your dream job as a kid like we all I wanted to be a baseball player you yeah. know like I'm five eight like that ain't gonna happen but what what was your dream job as a kid to be honest I wanted to make video games really I, I mean I love video games I just remember probably 
the best gift I ever gotten was a PlayStation 2 when I was in high school for getting decent grades, and, and I went out and modded the PlayStation 2 so I could play all the games from around the world, not yeah. just the ones that are released in the U.S. And, right. You know, that was probably the last thing. My, I, I think my parents would have preferred that I become an artist and be a <laughs> video game creator. So. But in a way, you, you, you've certainly influenced yes. the video. We're going to talk about it later. Yes. But yeah. you, you've been able to somewhat live that dream. Yes. Um, I, I'm still not a baseball player, but you've been able to live that dream kind of uh, in, a, in a less direct way. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious what, what you would say to not just this audience, but again, younger people that are watching this. What are things, when you look back on your career um, as an entrepreneur, as an investor, and then as a student, were there things during your undergraduate days, whether it was in the classroom or outside the classroom, that you think would have better prepared you for the startup life? And what advice would you give a, a student in this audience? Yeah. I mean, I think number one is really actually maybe in some interesting way getting experience outside of the classroom. Um, I think, you know, the, mo the classes that were my favorite classes anyway were ones that involved us going out and deal, doing field work. I was a bio major and you know, we went out and did field work. Um, and the most interesting non, you know, sort of classroom experiences all revolved around volunteering at organizations, uh, interning at companies, mm -hmm. um, even, you know, doing research in classroom work, but in a different part of the world. I was in India for a whole summer oh, wow. doing biology research there. Um, it just, it really opens your eyes to what, you know, different path there are in life. Yep. And I think that was, you know, by far the most, um, most important lessons I learned out of out of college, and and I think one of the the best things about college for me was really uh, Harvard. Probably more than anything, I mean, like there's there's a lot of things that are good about Harvard, a lot of things that are not good about Harvard, and I think the number one thing for me was that they made it a point to recruit people that I think were just a little bit more commercially minded than I would mm. say that you know folks at some of the other Ivy Leagues folks at MIT, et cetera. Um, and I just remember having classmates who were like, you know, first day in school were thinking about what internship they're gonna try to get in freshman year. And I was mm. like, I don't know what an internship is. It's like, I'm trying to hear it, like go shadow some doctors and do research in a lab. Um, and you just see that across, you know, it wasn't, you don't have to be an e-com major to do that. You don't have yep. to be an engineering major to do that. Like people were very interested in seeking opportunities outside of campus as well. And so yep. I, I've always, I think that's critical. Yeah, I encourage students to. And sometimes students think, well, I'm going to start building my network when I graduate. Like, no, start yeah. building your network now, get a mentor, get an intern. These folks have heard me say this over and over again. So yeah. it's good to hear, Absolutely. Uh, hear you reinforce yeah. that. So we, we talked about your, your home life, uh, parents that weren't necessarily you know, thrusting you out into the startup world. Sure. I'm curious, as you were studying biology at Harvard, when did you decide, or was it right when you graduated, when was that point where you, th you thought the startup world made sense for you? Yeah, it was honestly really last minute. I mean, I, I did lab work my whole four years there. Um, I wrote my thesis on neurogenesis on your factory bulb, which basically just means uh, I had to do a lot of surgeries on my springs and use our imaging equipment at midnight because <laughs> during the day that's all used by grad students and postdocs. And, and I think I got really caught up in that. Like, I don't think I really sort of lifted my head up enough mm -hmm. to think mm -hmm. about other opportunities um, and it wasn't until actually after I took my MCAT um, and I was you know shadowing doctors. Oh, so you were still on that medical oh, path? Oh yeah, yeah yeah I took my MCAT I got my rec letters this was you know summer before senior year I was shadowing doctors and one of them was just one of them was like a ER doc and, and, and there was also PCPs and others and like none of them were that happy um, mm. and they were all kind of telling me that you know I think I was like, what does it take to be a great doctor? And they're like, well, I think you have to specialize a lot. Like in this country, you know, practicing medicine, like you get rewarded both financially and sort of in terms of recognition from your peers and whatnot, like the, the deeper and the more narrow you go. Right. You know, not just a cardiologist, but a cardiologist who specialized in this kind of surgeries. Yeah, and a neonatal. Or yeah, and, and had, you know, clinical publications on this thing and et cetera, et cetera. And, and I just realized like I don't, necessarily want to do that for the rest of my life and be that yep. narrow yep. Um, and on top of it you know these people were kind of implicitly telling me that like you know this I mean to succeed you have to do that and you don't seem like you're that bought into it so you should really think about then devoting the next four year to med school another on average three to you know four to five for residency right and fellowship and then yep. you know you're like 30 something before you you're sort of working. Right. And so that's when I actually made the hard pivot. I mean, I basically talked to a couple of my friends who were not in medicine and they were, you know, going out, getting jobs in banking, consulting, 
um, engineering um, and uh, ask for their advice for like what jobs I can look for. And look, I wasn't looking for startup jobs to start with. Like I, I don't, I didn't know very much about startups. Yep. Um, and instead I recruited was the usual, you know, consulting firms and banking firms, et cetera. Except that this was 2009, so it's not exactly the best year to be looking for a job, especially for someone who's never had any sort of real business experience uh, coming out trying to do business. And really, you know, none of that worked out. And I ended up actually, um, through a bunch of the work talking with different consulting firms, I ended up, you know, getting connected to some former consultants who are now at this healthcare startup mm -hmm. in, in Boston. And, you know, interview with them and got really fascinated by what they were trying to do as a company, which was really focused on how do you take, by the way, the same problems that we're currently trying to solve in healthcare, sadly, how do you take medical records and medical claims data, analyze them, and be able to figure out you know, which of your patients are really sick, which of them are being treated incorrectly, missing sort of care protocols right. in what's been done with them, and how do you inform the health systems, and how do you inform the insurance companies you know, to, to go fill those gaps. Um, and I just, I kind of got interested in that and ultimately ended up joining that company. So you were able to leverage some of the, the undergrad. I, I'm not sure if you know Miles Beckett from... Yes, no Miles. Well. Do you yeah, know Miles? Investors. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right on. So, sorry. Um, we're speaking in code. So I interviewed Miles years ago. Oh, nice. He, you know, I don't know if you know his background. He was at yes. Johns Hopkins yes. yeah. in an elite surgical program yeah. when he came to the epiphany that you came to as a junior in college, which was, I don't want to be a doctor. Yeah. I mean, he was literally taking, you know, he said, I hear I was taking a spot from somebody who really wanted to be a yeah. surgeon, and yeah. he just said no. And then he went off and did Lonely Girl, exactly. and he was one of the first web series ever. He's been immensely successful, but yeah. it's interesting. And he went back to healthcare and started a Yeah, he did. Well, I'm an yeah. well, my firm is an investor yeah, in there, wonderful. too. Yeah. Um, I just, as you were saying that, I'm like, I wonder if you know Miles, because it's a very similar journey. You were just a little quicker on the uptake, I think. Yeah, and then there were other people who were much quicker than me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's interesting that you did still kind of stay that course of healthcare. I'm curious when you were working at Versant, how to what, because I, I know a lot of students are concerned that they want that first job out of, out of college to leverage their degree, which is reasonable and rational. Mm -hmm. To what extent were you leveraging biology or, or not in that first job? Yeah, honestly not. Yeah, um, I, I suspected. I learned, my job, I was, uh, I was on product team, I was a business analyst. So my job was to look at all of our product specs, um, work out those requirements. Um, and then work with the engineers uh, to figure out you know, what to build and how to build. Right. And our you know, product, as I mentioned earlier, deals a lot with data, right? So we're looking at medical claims, medical records. So much of our analysis, st statistical analysis, were done in R, were done in SQL. Mm. And I, I, I took one CS class in college, right, right. which I liked. It was actually quite fun. Um, and then I ended up learning how to do SQL um, so that I can actually do my job. <laughs> right, right. Um, and you know, I, I think it's, it's it's very important to really not so much look at maybe even the company you want to join or even the team you want to join, but really look at very specifically, you know, who your, you know, who your sort of boss and mentor is going to be. Mm -hmm. And that person, and there were two of them, uh, had a really big impact on me. Um, and one of them was a PhD in bio. Nice. Uh, finished it, decided didn't, she didn't want to pursue academia and joined McKinsey and then afterwards joined this. And, you know, uh, just was a very analytically minded, mm -hmm. uh, so she took a lot of that background from her PhD and applied that to all the, the work that she was doing in business. And the other guy was actually ended up becoming our chief medical officer. He was, he was a doctor um, and then turned into, uh, you know, specifically healthcare and consulting and worked a lot on public policy, population health before joining the company. And it was just, they were the type of managers that actually spent time with their team and yep. wanted to cultivate talent, um, cared about people rising through the ranks. and you know, that was the most important thing when I thought about, you know, should I join this company or not? No, that is, yeah. that is really wise advice. When I'm talking to students that are in an interview process, I, I coach them. That's one of the things you need to be looking for because yeah. they get so worried about how do I present myself in the best yeah. light. Of course, that's important, but you need to be evaluating the opportunity. Exactly. And that's one thing I always say is, will you, what will you learn from that person? Are they, do they have the personality or the proclivity to want to teach a younger person? Yeah. Not everyone does yeah. because you're building that foundation that the rest of your career is going to sit on, right? So you want that foundation to be really strong. Exactly. So yeah. good for you. Uh, mentors make a huge yeah, difference. Yeah, I was very lucky to have the right people. Yeah. Well, it's, I sense that your instincts were probably pretty good too as to you know, making sure that those were the right people. Right. Right. So I'm going to go to the first student's question in one minute um, after this question. 
So you get a biology degree, then you go to a uh, healthcare startup, learn all these new skills that you didn't, you know, that you didn't know when you were an undergrad. You then went the consulting mm -hmm. route, which is less typical, right? Usually yes. you go right into, right into that. What yeah. prompted that move? And two part question. Now that you look back on it, what skills do you think you cultivated as a consultant that have helped you as an investor? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so part of that was driven by, um, as I mentioned, both of my managers were, were consultants. Mm. Um, and uh, they've always sort of imprinted on me, like you should, you know, you're in a product role, but you should always try to step back and think about really ultimately what is it that your customers, uh, customers need? Yep. How do you work with other departments in the company like sales and marketing and really try to understand the higher level goals of the company yep. versus like, your day-to-day -day is just so narrowly focused on the specific product features, right? Yep, you're trying yep. to work with engineers on delivering, you know, at the right, um, right timing and deadlines. And so, you know, I wanted to get some of that business training. I didn't feel like, you know, by the way, that company I joined, it was crazy. I mean, like, they went public when I was there. Then that company, it was the first IPO on NASDAQ after the recession. Then that company grew, you know, purposely grew through acquisitions, right? All inorganic. They just mm -hmm. bought up a bunch of companies around data analysts in healthcare, mm -hmm. multiple offices. It was kind of this like whirlwind crazy journey where I would say even like maybe top down, there wasn't, there almost like wasn't weren't time to react to like what is really our clear cut strategy, what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I felt like, you know, I can learn that in consulting and be able to learn it across different clients across different situations. Right. And the biggest caveat would have been like, you know, sometimes you get unlucky when you're in consulting and you don't get on the right projects. And right. that's where my managers were like, look, you should actually benefit since you're going in with some job experience. That's almost like an automatic check mark on like, oh yeah, maybe I should throw Kevin on the healthcare cases, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and two, they were like, look, you just have to, you have to fight for the projects. It's not like you expect a staffer at the firm or HR or whatever yep. to just, you know, magically select you for the project you want to do like you right. need to figure out what are the ones out there which ones you think are the most interesting like getting fun of those partners those associates those managers to learn more about it and you know every, again every single project you do that's a set of relationships you you build and then in turn you can then leverage that for additional projects so i i was quite you know again quite lucky um and you know was able to get on all the right projects um i did mostly m a projects mostly strategy projects didn't get on any of the sort of very interesting but sometimes you know very long right, operational right, projects where right. like after we bought the company we need to figure out how to integrate the two and those are interesting the only downside is being like it can take like a year yep. so it really cuts down on like how much you can learn out of consulting which is really one of the few jobs where like you can learn something brand new, a brand new industry every two months. And so yeah. I wanted to maximize that. Effort. Well, and you also get exposed to your net, your network grows exponentially yeah. because you're, you're not just, it's not just the people you work with in the building. It's yeah. all these different companies. Yeah. So you make lots of great connections. I, uh, students will come to me and say, what do you think about consulting? I like it for young people. You get to see all these different cultures. Mm -hmm. You get to see different management styles. You get to learn from what you doesn't fit for you, what yeah. you don't like. Whereas if you're, you know, if you're in one business, that's the one business you, that's your frame of reference for, yes. you know, probably three years or two or three yeah. years. Um, so, so I'm with you on that. As far as getting on the right projects, the most important person in a consulting firm yeah. is the staffing person, right? Yeah. And they're often not the most powerful person. No. So it's always yeah. good to, to have a good relationship with that Absolutely. individual. Absolutely. And and I think you know, for me, I, I didn't realize, if, you know. Consulting wasn't necessarily the right thing for me long term, um, and I think the number one thing, and I'm, you know, people bring this up all the time, is when you're acting as the consultant, advisor, etc. Like ultimately, you can only do so much mm -hmm. to try to impl influence decisions and get an actual action out of all the work you've done. Right. And that part was probably the hardest thing for me. Like it just didn't feel like, you know, some of the stuff. You know, like yes, when we helped on an M and A and they actually bought the company, great. Right, but a lot of other things ultimately, you know, stri strategic priorities change. Honestly, sometimes there's a lot of politics. Yep. I mean, like so yep. and so SVP at a company might have already the answer in mind, and he wants to, you know, outsiders yep. to sort of come in and, you know, you know, code it with yep. a pane of gold and be like, yep. see, this is externally valid. Here's my watch. Tell me what time it is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and that, you know, I didn't, I didn't really want to do that for the rest of my life, um, and. I actually was not looking for an investing job, really. I mean, mm. I was looking to actually go back to startups. Well, that was, care. I, I was gonna, let's, we'll talk about that, and okay. then we'll get the first student's question. I, I was gonna ask you, what, what was that pivot then from, you know, consulting, great proving ground, you yeah. did it for years. Yeah. Why upfront and why that pivot into, into exactly. VC? Exactly, yeah. I, 
it's driven by, you know, I wanted to join someplace early stage. My, the last startup, I mentioned I went public, so it's very late stage. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to be part of a smaller team and more nimble, be able to do more. And that's, um, you know, that's not necessarily what investment really is. And the thing that really drew me up front was the fact that you mentioned earlier, alluded to, that was the time when we as a firm wanted to change ourselves. GRP. Uh, yeah, we, we used to be called GRP. We had been around since 96. Retail focused. Heavy retail focused and expanded into Broadly Software. You know, four partners have been there. They had one or two associates at any point in time. And yeah. I would argue it's just a little bit more of a traditional model. Yeah. And, and they were looking to grow the partnership, grow the junior investment team, adding actual functional roles to be able to directly help our portfolio companies around marketing, mm -hmm. around talent. We ended up bringing in our own PM, our own engineer to mm -hmm. build products for us so that we can be more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, sort of the impetus behind all of that is, you know, how do we make sure that we stay competitive and we're servicing entrepreneurs you know, in a modern way that, uh, you know, that stays competitive right. and is authentic. And two, you know, we can't keep investing the same things over and over again, right? right? Like that's, you know, that doesn't ultimately work. Technology changes very quickly and affects different industries at different times. So we, you know, yes, we are interested in talking to you, Kevin, because you're interested in healthcare and you have this biology background and maybe there's things behind there that's interesting. Hey, yes, we do want to add a partner that's in and around enterprise and SaaS and do more there, et cetera. And that sort of, that felt very entrepreneurial to me. And it was, if any of you guys know, you know, when a small partnership goes through a massive change like that, Oftentimes it not, it doesn't work out. Right. But also when it does, that's like the real moments of transformation and everything in the culture can change. So that's felt like a startup to me. Yeah, and I, and I vicariously was you know, part of that with Mark and yes. that was his first investment was in Voca. And, I, and I'm very um, happy to give a commercial for Upfront because I've been on a couple boards. You, we've invested and we, had a, we sold a company to Apple mm -hmm. together. We've had some success. Yeah. And every single venture capitalist will tell you that they're gonna roll up their shirt sleeves and they're gonna be there when you need them and they're gonna work really hard. Most of them won't. And I've seen it in action. When it would have been easy, everyone's like, one, two, three, not me. You know, like, yeah. ah, I don't want to deal with that. Like, um, Upfront consistently yeah. leans in, supports their companies, founder friendly, founder centric, but at the same time, want to do the right by all the investors. Yeah. It's really a good combination. So, anyway, thank you. That's all true. Let's take the first student's question. All right. Hi. Um, hey. Looking at the uh, Upfront Ventures uh, people's page, mm -hmm. one can't help but notice the uh, number of relatively young people working as partners and uh, other highly ranked positions, yep. what kind of impact, if any, do you think that this has had on the success of your company? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to go along with what I was saying earlier about reinventing yourself always, right? Like it's, look, different people start different types of companies and that's just a fact. And, you know, when entrepreneurs look at the investors and they look at us and other investors, they're looking for people that they can relate to, right? And that would understand, you know, on a personal level as well as from, you know, a generational level, from a diversity level, from an industry experience level, operator investor experience, et cetera, all of that. They're looking for people that they can identify with and try to plug whatever gap that is that they have, right? And it's just a fact. Like, I mean, like, you can't expect, you know, someone, you know, let's say older to still be as adept and using all the modern technology tools, right? Yeah. Like, they might have started three companies before, but how they think about what are the right workflow and how do you set up teams like that yep. just changes. Yeah. Right? And we all have to continue to learn and figure out what works these days and what are new modes, new tools, new products that can help out. So we just told ourselves that like we have to make sure that our partnership reflects the type of people that we invest in. Mm -hmm. And that's from every single perspective of background and experience. And mm -hmm. so, so that's why we made it a point, you know, and, and that's just one vector you pointed out, right? That, that we've continued to work on and continue to, bring people in um, and you know we it's experimental too right it's not like we do it right every time and we you know back then as I was mentioning it's pretty stable like four partners one or two associates kind of the same model for many many 15 years 16 years yep. and then we started thinking about like well what does it mean to have a proper associate program what does it mean to have analysts versus associates how do you have mid-level positions how do you promote what programs do you hire from like those were all things that we experimented with and mm -hmm. tried everyone you know hiring and working with people right from different backgrounds and we had an 18 or 19 year old join us for a year, year and a half, to people right out of college, to people who had you know, a little bit of job experience in a consulting firm, to people with PhDs and work experience. It's all part of you know, our own sort of iterative learning as well to figure out you know, who are the right people that 
can mirror the types of entrepreneurs we're trying to invest in. And, and, you, and you, I think, have brought in some very creative EIRs. I mean, a chameleon air, right, yeah, yeah. one of your EIRs. Yeah. And so really looking for creativity outside of the traditional Ivy League business schools yeah. or you know, where, 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 where VCs used to come from. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I think that's, that's certainly been to your benefit. Let's go ahead and take another student's question. Hi. Um, Hi. You said as a kid your dream job was to make video games and mm -hmm. that you're still a passionate gamer. Yeah. Uh, given your work experience in consulting and startups, uh, do you think you have any ideas of possibly combining both your passion for video games and specific industry knowledge into a future project? Yeah, uh, I think there's two layers to that question. You know, one, I'm still, I still try to play games when I can. It's actually really the main way that I stay in touch with my friends. Um, you know, instead uh -huh. of texting or calling, whatever, like we would jump into a game together and voice chat, et cetera. Um, and I've invested in everything from actual gaming companies to, you know, back end game engine tech used to create game tools, games to front end, you know, how do you connect a streamer with a fan and get them to talk about and build community around the games they like. Um, so I, I'm a big believer in the industry and I think it will continue to grow and evolve and it's already the largest industry for entertainment right like it's eclipsed you know box office and eclipsed you know streaming all that kind of stuff to be you right. know you should get it's like over 100 billion dollars already in the industry so um now do i want to start a project start a company in and around games i think that actually goes a lot more towards um you know there were definitely a couple years in the middle at upfront where i thought about hey we have these incredible portfolio companies some i worked very closely with there are opportunities where I can join them and work there. And you know, do I want to sort of continue down this investor path or do I want to think about going back into the operational side? Um, and ultimately, I decided not to go back to the operational side. And that's very much a function of I just realized that I valued variety a lot. I think if I were doing the same company, the same product for you know, five, six, seven years, that's not really the best fit for me personally. And I particularly like working with companies early on. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what we do at a front. We usually go in the, at the Series C, Series A rounds. Yep. We jump on the boards. We get very active with companies. And so in some ways, like the multiple gaming-related things I've invested in, I feel like I've played you know, a small role um, in, you know, in helping them and supporting them. And that kind of scratches my, my entrepreneurial operational itch. Versus, at least for now, right? For now, yeah. And, and you also just realize like you really need the right people to start a company with. It's, it's, it's much less about the idea. Yep. Much more about the people. Totally. Um, and, you know, like that will probably sway me more than anything if, yeah, to your point, if someone incredible comes along down the road and it was the right timing and, and they were interested and we get along and we want to start a company, you can never strike that out. That's like one of those rare, you know, only a couple of times in, in sort of a lifetime opportunities that you have right. to jump on. Right. You know? Are you comfortable telling us what games, your game of choice right now? What? Yeah. Uh, well, I've always been a PC gamer, um, other than the time I had a PlayStation 2, and I still have a gaming PC, and sadly I don't really have time to play that much. So th the game that I'm still playing is Overwatch, um, which is a very fun multiplayer game that you can really play together with your friends, and, yep. and that's kind of when we, when we catch up. Um, I do play a lot of games on mobile, most of them for testing purposes, mm, right, right. <laughs> less so than, than for fun, but some of the older ones that I've continued to play, um, one actually we invested in called Best, Fing Best Fiends on the casual side, also I've always been a Nintendo fan, so I play Fire Emblem on, on mobile. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what is your um, just general point of view in eSports? Have you guys placed a bet there? What do, you, what do you kind of think of that space? Yeah, we've sort of placed a bet there many years ago. Uh, in a company called uh, um, Alpha Draft, which actually was doing, you know, like fantasy football, but they're doing that for video games. Yep. Um, and they actually en ended up selling to FanDuel. Um, uh, okay. And, you know, that was a good exit for all of us. Um, and, you know, since then, and this was four years ago, we have not made any sports per se bets. And I spent a lot of time looking at that ecosystem. Um, I think it's 100% true that, you know, obviously, especially, you know, folks, you guys would all know this. I don't have to tell you this. Like, the not only the people playing, but the people watching sports have just grown exponentially and eclipsed, I would say, actually most, you know, major sports. And in fact, if you obviously take the collection of video games out there, like that's now. Right. I mean, like it, it very much rivals every other, and if not surpasses every other entertainment option. And I think the really sort of hard part for me as an investment is we're always looking for 
scalable companies. Right. And esports is still in this sort of transition phase where if you look at how a lot of esports teams, tournament organizers, leagues, software tools for organizing esports, et cetera, how they're thinking about the market, they still think of it almost too much like sports. It's like if a sports team or if a sports league makes money off of ticketing when you go watch the match or they sell you like a jersey, you know, as merchandise or Coke when you're watching the game or they do TV, at, you know, TV sponsorship and TV rights and they get, you know, billion dollars to have exclusive to, to, to showcase the Olympics. Like that's how money has been made. And that's, I think, very heavily how people are still looking to monetize esports. And I just don't think a lot of those are venture scalable. And I don't mm. think a lot of those are ultimately the most authentic and native way to quote unquote monetize gamers right and at the end of the day you know again these are games that you play right these are games that you watch on the internet on twitch on youtube not on right. tv right and you have a much more you have a much closer relationship with these players and teams than you would with you know a football or basketball player right um you can't you know you can't chat with a football or basketball player easily you can't play games with them easily and right. these are all right. things that you can do as gamers and how do you funnel that sort of very native digital interaction in a scalable way that I'm still looking for that and, and you know if I find it I'd love to invest. I know, I know one of your fellow partners Kobe Fuller you know one of his foci was VR yeah. for a while and yeah, yeah. I know it still is did do you guys have a point of view on VR as a firm yeah. or do or personally yeah he and I actually spent quite a bit, bit virtual, of time virtual on, reality yeah on yeah VR like AR yeah, immersive. I mean, he was an angel investor in Oculus, yeah. and, and he's, you know, anyway, yeah, we both are still big believers. And, and to us, really, it's, it's, it really does feel like a next computing platform. It's a new way to interact, right, with information and other people. And I think the, the fundamental roadblock is the hardware at this point. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just too expensive, too cumbersome. The Oculus Quest is a big step up. You don't, it's, there's no tethers, there's no wires. You don't, you don't need a beefy computer to use it. You don't need a PlayStation to use it, et cetera. Um, but still, like it, you know, it's two, three hundred dollars. Um, and if you were to make an apples to apples comparison to, you know, buying a game console or <laughs> buying a new TV or buying a whatever, like it's the value is not necessarily quite there yet. Um, and it's going to take, I think, one or two more generations of hardware for it to become so seamless that, you know, you don't feel like there's a hurdle to putting it on. And then it takes that also then to actually drive developers to make enough content. Um, yeah, I think right. we saw. A, Tremendous explosion of developers, mostly coming from the gaming world because the number one use case has been games, but also from elsewhere in graphics design, right. in visual effects, in um, you know enterprises as well around construction, car design, all that kind of stuff. Um, jump into VR and create content, and uh, I think there's a little bit of a lull at this point. I think. People have now seen examples of where you can make real money, like 10, 20, 30 million dollars off of a game that you make for VR, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit less consistent. And so I think it takes a couple more generations for developers to really grow and scale to the point where they feel like, I can make a mobile game or I can make a VR game. Right, and right, I think right. I can be just as successful with an audience that are just as, you know, maybe not as big, but willing to pay more, right, et cetera. So you think the bottleneck is hardware at this point, yeah. primarily, and then the, the developers will start writing for it when the audience is bigger. Do you think, um, and we'll um, move on from games, but yeah. I have one more kind of a follow-up. Do you think the, who's gonna be the hardware winner? Is it gonna be Facebook, Google, or is it gonna be somebody we haven't heard of yet that's gonna come in with a revolutionary design? Is it, is it so expensive that it really has to be a big incumbent? Yeah, I mean, there are actually some interesting startups working on next-gen uh, hardware. Uh, Vario is one, for example, out of actually Finland, which has always been a really strong place for gaming, but also actually for chips and hardware, given Nokia. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's necessarily an incumbent that has to wait. I do think that the incumbents in this space, like Facebook um, and Microsoft and Sony and these people, more than ever now, they have so much capital and so much cash that I think it's quite, I don't think they're gonna ever sort of, I think it'll be very hard for them to pass up an opportunity to buy one of these startups. Mm. Um, and I think they'll keep trying even if the startup doesn't wanna sell and at, at some point, like it's just, you know, for all the shareholder value wise, Crazy and even money. for the founders, it's just like why, you know, like you can't turn that down. Right. Um, I don't think they're gonna let, you know, these independent companies just become wildly successful, um, with their hardware, and I think the hardest thing really is getting getting developer attention, and that's again that's a currency that the larger companies just they just have a lot of 
more developers yep. in their camp than any startup would. And they have incentives they can provide to yeah, front yeah, exactly. front end front end expenses and yeah yeah I, I do think we'll see you know more and more M and A in the space as well. Uh, you know it certainly had to stop startups from raising right. capital and going for it right, which right. I think is amazing and and uh, but I think you know if I have to bet I would say it would be probably through cobbling together a handful of different startups for different mm. key pieces of the tech from optics to to you know to the algorithms to uh, the actual hardware processing and uh, chip capabilities to to sort of have the this is the winner yeah. device and nobody has the compression algorithms and the chips and the yeah uh, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, exactly. head, the headset design yeah. let's go ahead and take another yeah. student's question in regard to your interest in healthcare how did you find yourself working at a top consulting firm like BCG for having gone from taking the MCAT and studying biology like was a pretty awesome turnaround, I feel like. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I mean, I actually am a big advocate that I think having had some work experience and then going to things like consulting and banking where you're sort of that service provider to a lot of different variety of people, I, I found my first job to be incredibly helpful for consulting. I, it just, I just, you know, especially, you know, like most people, especially if they haven't done enough internships in college or whatever, like I just had a lot of real world work experience beyond just like actually doing the work, but more important than probably anything else, like how to work with people. And you, you sort of figure out what it is to work on a team together. Um, and that's really probably the part of that, that people part of the job is really something that you just can't really replicate uh, in an academic setting. Um, and you know, like a lab is very different than what a real work environment is. And even if you work on a project together with your, your friends or classmates, like that's that's very different than a real world sort of people and politics and the different layers and like having different constituents from your own, you know, sort of employees and, 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 and you know, coworkers to customers to partners to whatever. Um, and so that helped me a lot in, in being able to get more out of consulting, which again, it's, consulting is about, and to a certain degree banking, they're the type of jobs where like, you get about as many training wheels as you would ever see in a company. Like they really have like, Everything from career counseling to staffing to you know subject matter experts across every area, and the, you know try to ensure that you're you're you know also having a good time with your peers and you're getting access to partners and whatever. But but like even in that environment, like you get what you get out of that job is what you put into it and how you decide to spend your time and who to spend the time with. And I just had a little bit more of that from my first job than the people who went straight in from from college. And so that I I really took a lot away from that and was able to get the most out of consulting. Yeah. I want to go back to your career at Upfront. So you, you had mentioned 2012, the, the firm was changing, it was a startup in its own right, um, and you were able to progress through a number of different stages. Yeah. And I'm not sure those stages are clear to everyone. So mm -hmm. associate, senior associate, principal, and then partner. I'd be curious to hear what, if you could just characterize each of those and what skills are required for, to be successful mm -hmm. at each one. And then, if, if we can, if this is not too much to ask you, yeah. then how, do, how has that informed the, um, the way that, um, you know, your criteria and strategy that you use now to vet deals? So you, you kind of grew up in venture capital. Yeah. And it's, uh, just a bit of an open-ended question, but yeah, also yeah. a bit of an education for people that don't understand those levels. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you know, levels actually vary quite a bit across firms. And again, this is, as I mentioned earlier, it's related to a function of the firm's investment strategy. And so... A lot of firms might have the same titles, but they might mean very mm -hmm. different things. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, there's there's fundamentally really two key parts, right? Two sort of the two sides. I mean, one is you're doing a lot of the analytical work um, and networking, et cetera, to to surface and then make a judgment call on an opportunity, right? And then there's the other part of the job, which is really your almost like sales, right? Um, like trying to convince the founders that, hey, we should be partners in business together. Yeah, yeah. Not only like at this moment when I'm trying to give you money, but like down the road, every you know decision that, key decision that gets made at the board, like I'm one voice at the board, you have other voices at the board. Like yep. you're always debating and discussing and influencing, right? And sort of that part of the job is very different, I would say skill set and training than the purely you know surfacing the right opportunities and doing the analytical work to understand it. And so I would say, you know, the associates, the senior associate, the VPs, like the earlier stages in venture, you know, in, in a venture company, like that's where more of your time is spent versus the later stage, let's say the principals or the junior partners or the partners, more of your time is spent, you know, dealing with founders, board work, um, you know, convincing them to, uh, you know, 
raise capital, to hire X or Y person, convincing people to join those companies, convincing right, right. other investors to, hey, you should really look at this and think about investing, yep. you know, even convincing potential partners and customers, like, yep. hey, you know, why, why does this matter to, to your own company and sort of what you're trying to achieve in your mission? Like that, your job becomes much more of that. And I think, you know, the thing I would look for the most in a venture firm is like the opportunity to get exposure to that second part. And that's just, that's not going to come unless the firm is interested and willing and want to, you know, give their associates and junior members on the team that opportunity, right? Like yep. some firms don't let you go to board meetings, right? Like some firms, you know, give you instead board observers. Which seats. I don't understand. I mean, I know Mark was always good about, and some of those folks ended up, I would see them as young people in their mid-20s that later became partners yeah. with, with Upfront. Yeah, yeah. And they started their taking notes, listening, yeah. following up on certain specific areas yeah. that we needed to follow up on. Yeah. Some firms literally don't, like they have partners meetings where they decide on what investments to make, and they, it's only partners, mm. which is like crazy to me. Like that's literally the part where you can probably learn the most because it's also the most frequent. It's every week. Yeah. And seeing how different partners debate and think about what's a good investment, what's not. And even the harder questions is like, we are already invested. And should we invest it again, especially when the company is, you know, not doing so hot? Like, yeah. those are the, like, real discussions that if you're precluded from that, like, you're just not going to learn, like, what, what all the constraints and, you know, equations and, you know, what really matters in venture. No. Um, so definitely look, you know, look for firms that, that give you that kind of opportunity, um, you know, versus, like, you know, there are firms, especially later stage firms, that are very much more, I would say, tiered and organized. Like, hey, look, there's the, you know, post college, you do a lot of analysis work, and I really just need you to work on that, and that's what you get trained on. Mm -hmm. Versus then, we really want to see you out there working at a startup um, or a larger tech company, and you go gain the operational and people skills there. Then you come back in, and mm -hmm. then we'll, you know, work on you know, sort of uh, that partnership path, um, put you on boards and get you some of that very specific startup, early to mid to grow stage sort of board and, right. and founder dynamic work. And, you know, different firms work different ways, but, but I think it's, it's a pretty big jump going from the first part uh, to the second part. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of people don't make it. They don't have the skills or yeah, aptitude or yeah. desire. Or they realize they don't want to do that. Right, right. Like it's, right. Yeah. Did, no, I don't know how, um, um, how upfront deployed you as an associate. I've seen associates and I've seen, mm -hmm. and in fact, often consultants for the company. Yeah. Um, but did, did you end up having to do a lot of cold calling in the small companies trying to scout like what's going on in VR? Or, you did do some of that because I think that's... I, I did. Um, so we actually had a pretty, I mean, I was, you know, pretty lucky because again, when I joined, that's when we, I mentioned we were revamping sort of our entire like, yeah. how do we think about the investment team from senior to junior? Um, and there was no like, there was no rule book. Right, like it's not like this is the way you do it, and that's that's the way that works the yeah. best. And and so we had a good amount of freedom. I specifically chose to not spend a lot of time going outbound and cold calling, and instead just working on the handful of relationships that both I already had, just given mm -hmm. my past work, mm -hmm. but as well, you know, we did have the opportunity to interface with our founders, go to board meetings, and actually, yeah, I, I like worked on a couple of projects for a couple of our companies, and like leverage those relationships right into other founders or people they knew that might be starting companies. And I just kind of built it out that way. You know, it certainly probably was slower than the other people who were like, going to go out and look at all the data out there and see which companies has raised X dollars, you know, three months ago. Yeah. And that's where I go hit make up 20 to... calls a day. Exactly. Um, but, you know, I, I, I tailored it much more to the industries that I either had some background in or just were more interested in. Right. And that helped me at least in building on a little bit more of a um, deeper network in those areas right. um, and that's kind of how I did it versus other people do it differently right like they might spend a lot of time out there um, talking to more people and being you know going to more networking events and whatever and, and building up that way yep interesting so yeah. there's something in the in VC called the anti-portfolio which yep. basically means the companies you should have invested in but didn't I have yeah. a I have a great yeah, one yeah. my anti-portfolio is amazing um, Scopely is one of them. It's a gaming company that's a multi-billion dollar Actually company. Yeah. They, yeah, you guys did it. I had a chance to. No, we I, didn't invent. That was one of our anti portfolios. Oh, is that Scopely. an anti portfolio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, they, the founders are great. They're still like very willing. They've helped me a couple times on, on yeah. various things. They were small, maybe like, I don't know, eight or 10 people at the time. We could have owned a decent percentage of the business, but it felt kind of small for us, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's a bunch of others. Zip Recruiter is another one. I can go yep. on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. What, so do you have, um, I know you have an anti-portfolio, but are, are there companies specifically that at any of these stages that you were, you know, maybe before you got to be a partner, that kind of got away from you, 
And if so, what did you learn from that? Like I could, I could bore you with what I learned as a recruiter, what I learned, you know, with Uber, et cetera. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear what you, a couple yeah. of the ones that maybe didn't work out for you and what you learned from that. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, there are, there's a lot actually. Yeah. <laughs> and I think any- But that's the game, that's the nature that's the of game. it. Yeah, and if, if any VC doesn't have that, that means they were not looking at right. the right deals right. that were, you know, high quality and competitive. Right. And they either made the wrong call and didn't invest or they got competed out, right, by someone else. Um, and so there are a lot. I, I think, you know, first I'll talk a little bit maybe top down. Like I think the number one thing is that you have to first get in front of them. Right? Like you, you have to be able to at least have that conversation. Right. And those are the things that hurt the most where like maybe it's a deal in your area of expertise or in your backyard and mm-hmm. yet you never even met them and mm-hmm. they went on to raise money. Right. And, and I think that's the thing where like I continue to try to refine, you know, and figure out like, okay, who, you know, who are the real influencers, let's say in healthcare or gaming, you know, I have breadth of contacts now, but who, you know, should I go deeper on to make sure the right things get surfaced? Yep. Um, you know, how do I get in front of these entrepreneurs earlier on? You know, even let's say when they're not interested in talking to VCs, again, you kind of have to, for them to want to talk to you, you have to provide something to them. Right? Often the best be like, deals, right? Exactly. They're often the best deals. Um, and, and, and it was all ultimately, I think actually probably the heart, the, the, the lesson for me specifically is a lot of times when you go deep on an area and you look at like the 10th company in the space, you get so biased and jaded mm. that when, when the right one does come along, you sometimes don't see it. Mm. And, and a lot of times, actually, you know, let's say you were better at it, then you see it, but you're like, well, now's not the right time. Like, mm. maybe this is the right strategy, but it's still a bit early, or like, they're still missing a couple of folks on the team that I think is critical for this new enterprise pivot of the company, whatever, yep. you know, invest. And I think those are, those are probably the hardest, the hardest things for me because it's probably around that time point when like the industry is going through a lull or that particular tech trend is going through a lull that the real sort of next gen companies right. get built. Right. Um, and, and you have to like, I mean, to your point on VR, for example, like I have to not be biased to think like, oh, it's just like, it's too early for VR now. It shouldn't yeah. work, right? And instead actually continue to spend time with yeah. VR developers and understand, you know, like, has your opinions changed? Like, what is it like? Has a new hardware made a difference? Yep. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, one example, um, there's a trucking logistics company, for example, in LA that I looked at, um, Connex Trucking, and, you know, now, I mean, they're still early in their phase, so who knows if it'll ultimately work out, but it had a lot of the right elements of sort of the, the right founding team that mm-hmm. came from that industry, had their own business, saw the inefficiencies in how truckers are ultimately matched with the shipments that they want to deliver, and they ended up, you know, just sort of building out a company and trying to take a, create a more modern tech-enabled trucking logistics company, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, sort of, I kind of, for one reason or other, ultimately didn't quite get there on that space, partially because, like, oh, my God, billions of, you know, hundreds of millions at a time now, like, probably billion plus, two billion, yep. have been raised in your competitors, and you're still really early, and you want to go after a segment that is huge, but also the most competitive, and, um, you know, I think you should have raised X, but maybe you want to raise Y, like for you know, like a bunch of reasons. Ultimately, was like you know, I don't, I'm not sure this is the right fit at this moment. Yep. Um, and and to what I was saying earlier, probably the worst thing is then I kind of got continue to get biased by that on future mm-hmm. logistics companies mm-hmm. I looked at, right? Mm-hmm. And I really had to like, maybe it was at some point one day like raise your next round or the round after that was like I really have to like stop myself having these biases and. Yep go back to first principles and think about like, what is it, what is it about this space that originally drew me and what's changed in these years? And should I still be, you know, what should I be looking for? Right? Yeah, be so. self-aware and open-minded. Yeah. I mean, it's, so a lot of firms will say on their website and they'll tell you that they're leaders and their first, and most aren't. I mean, the, I think it's more fun. We were, we were generally the first check or, mm-hmm. you know, we would be um, with, you know, with another firm that was, that yep. was, that was yeah, leaning yeah. in. I always wanted to be this, the sounds good fun. Like mm-hmm. there's so many funds that are like, Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Kevin's in? Sounds good. Um, you got room yeah. in that round? Yeah. You know, Kevin, uh, you did the diligence, right? Okay, awesome. And there's so many investors that are like that. Like, they'll tell entrepreneurs, um, I'm in once you get a lead. What? I mean, if you're in, write a check. Yeah. That is so frustrating. Yeah. And then, you know, even nine times out of ten, they're not in when you get a lead. But yeah. I just tell the person no. Just say, no, I'm probably yes. not going to invest in your company. Yeah. And if I can help you in other ways, wonderful. But, you know, you need to move on to somebody that's going to write you a check. Absolutely. It's a tough business for entrepreneurs because there's it so is. many people that just, 
they'll just smile and nod their heads and they have you know, no intention of, of following through. Absolutely, yeah. So when you do follow through, I think that you can actually differentiate yourself in this industry. Yeah. When you really are, do try to be helpful, you're straightforward, like you're, you're, you're telling it like it is. Yeah. And, you, and again, even if you don't write a check, you try to, you try to turn them on to something if you can. Yeah. Let's take the last student question. Hi, Kevin. Um, speaking of anti-portfolios, how do you personally deal with the regret like after you find out that you missed a really good opportunity? This was actually, uh, uh, we literally had, it was like a younger VC kind of annual offsite thing. It was like roughly 100 people, and that just happened, whatever, three weeks ago. Or, and, uh, and like literally, they broke us into small groups of like 10, 12 people each. Um, and it's a variety of like, you know, sort of VP principals at VC firms to younger partners at VC firms. Um, and that was like the number one question. Mm. Like people were basically like, you know, now I'm in the job for a year, two years, three years. Like I've seen some good deals. I lose out. I miss stuff. Like that kills me. Like the, the, the regret of like what could I have done different and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, like maybe you would expect that conversation to turn into like, well, here are all the things you can tactically do so that like you, you minimize your chances of like losing deals and missing things, right? Actually, the majority of that conversation was focused on actually how do you deal with your own emotion, like what your, your own motivations are for mm -hmm. why you want to do this job mm -hmm. and how do you manage your own emotions? Because at the end of the day, if you're a successful VC, you're dealing with always like a pretty heavy slate of portfolio companies, yeah. right? And the last thing you want to do is add to their emotional roller coaster <laughs> as yep. founders of companies yep. when like, yep. you think that was bad that you lost a deal, like these guys like think the company- They can't might, make payroll. They <laughs> make payroll and the people that they've like promised and hired and you know like, just had a new kit, whatever, like things could really all go down to nothing, right? Yep. And like, yep. I think it's just, it's a vital skill to be able to manage your own emotions and figure out like, look, you know, here's the things I should do, right? Like it's different for everyone. Like maybe I feel sad about it. I give myself, you know, whatever a day. Um, I should certainly look at why is it that I lost or missed that deal yep. um, and, you know, record that whatever and try to do differently. And then, you know, for me, it's like, then you figure out like, how do you then, make a choice on like, how do you continue to interact with that founder in, in like a productive way? Yep. Um, and sometimes there isn't, like, yep. there's just nothing, right? Um, and then like you move, you move on, right? Like there's yes. like a bajillion, yes. like there's yes. always new deals to look at, you know, companies need help and you have to make sure that your attention and energy are, are focused on the right things. And, um, and as long as you do the right case studies on the past, then you just try to lower that chance. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, it, for me, it's usually like 2.30 in the morning, I'm laying in bed just going, oh, how much would I made on, oh, come, oh crap, that was a lot of money. Oh, well, wouldn't it change my life? And I roll over and go back to sleep. It's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it's not, what are you gonna do? Like stay up for another hour and a half and worry about it? Yeah. So yeah. I wanna end um, um, on a note about the future. So okay. when you think about, you know, 10 years from now, you know, whether you end up, you know, joining a company, starting your own VC firm, or staying with a front. Yeah. Like, how, what, what metrics, or how are you gonna define success over the next 10 years of your career? When you look back, you have gray hair like me, and you're thinking of, you know, gosh, did I really do what I wanted to do over those last 10 years? What would those things be? Yeah, um, I think the number one thing for me is really to have, uh, you know, I think, to have been with a handful of founders, sort of from the beginning all the way through to the end, whether it ultimately worked out or not, right? I think yep. that's beside the point. But to be able to look at myself and be like, hey, I was a good steward of capital. I was a an impartial board member. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I, I did the things and sort of counseled in such a ways that were best for the company. Um, I think it's a, it's it's a very sort of up to you time management job, right? That's, yep. what, that's what being an investor and a venture capitalist is. And you, you have to always examine yourself and make sure that you are allocating the right amount of time and effort into the companies you have. And the last thing I want to be, like even if I end up making more investments that maybe turn out better or whatever, is to do a disservice to the founders that I work with and have them ultimately, you know, even if they don't say it to other people, be like, yeah, you know, at a certain point, Kevin kind of, just dropped off and just yeah. wasn't, you know, like not someone I really talked to very much anymore yep. and like don't really need his help anymore, don't really know how to leverage his help. He doesn't seem to help very much. And like that's what I what I want to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, and look, that could be that could be as extreme as like I shouldn't be on your board. Yep. You're like now a hundred fifty million dollar run rate company and you really, you know, need someone who came from the banking sector, or, you know, who had this many years experience selling into payers in the healthcare space, that's what you want. And you know what? Yeah, 
we will nominate someone yep. with, you know, into our seat with that background, right? And, and we actually have this program. Like, we have board partners who come from industry who are yep. you know, experts in their areas, and, and you know, they, they take over our board seats here and there, right? And anyway, so I, that's, I think, the number one thing for me. I think it's a great way to look at it. I'm, you know, I, I recently uh, rolled off a board that I helped the, you know, helped the ideation, wrote the first check, and I was there 12 years. Yeah, and, wow. and the CEO came to me and I said, you should, you should get somebody, I mean, you know, again, it's harder for me to help a company that's that far along in their mm -hmm. maturation. I'm more helpful, you know, in the earlier stages. Yeah. And the CEO was like, wow, like nobody does this. Like, thank yeah. you. He was like, you know, re, you know, dreading, like I gotta tell John, you know, like maybe yeah. it's yeah, time. Exactly. And I'm like, it is time. We yeah. should do that. So I love that you have that, that philosophy. And I think with that philosophy, you're not, it's not about how much money did you make or how many deals you know, did you get written up about what a great investor you were. Yeah. It's really about the end of the day, the people. Did you do right by the people? Yeah. Did you do right by their teams? And did you right, do right by your own team and your own investors? Because yeah. people don't know it. The dirty secret, it's not even a secret, we have investors, right? Even yeah. though we are investors, we have people that yes. invested in us. So we take, we take someone else's capital and then we deploy it and we need to be fair to them, to yeah. our CEOs, to the employees, and to our own firm. So we Absolutely. have a lot of constituents. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So It's very important to pick the right investors to be in your fund as well. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so hats off to you, Kevin. I think that's a great approach. And thanks again for coming. I no, really thank you appreciate for having it. Me. Thank Absolutely. you guys so much. Thank you.